Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Mohammed Al Jabri from uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, be moderating this session, which is the third uh, out of a, a, a series of webinars that we are uh, having uh, across the Cleveland Clinic enterprise. And uh, we have a wonderful program covering electrophysiology uh, today uh, with a focus mostly on atrial fibrillation, but also on uh, uh, WPW. Uh, I'm pleased and honored to be joined by several of our faculty uh, from the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. And uh, co-moderating with me today will be Dr. Walid Saliba. Hello, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, being part of uh, this uh, series of uh, webinar. Um, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our, our first speaker, Dr. Muhammad Al Jabiri. Uh, Dr. Al Jabiri is uh, faculty and uh, in cardiac electrophysiology at Cleveland Clinic uh, Abu Dhabi, and what he will be talking about is something that is very important in the field of atrial fibrillation a new understanding and a new approach uh, to the treatment of atrial fibrillation that goes beyond just treating the disease itself. Dr. Al Jabri. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, join you uh, for this program uh, again. So uh, I'll be talking about atrial fibrillation, which is a lifestyle disease. I have no relevant disclosures. We'll start with the case. This is a 46-year-old male with no significant past medical history. He presents to the ER with palpitations for two hours. He drinks three units of alcohol every weekend and smokes half a pack per day. On present day, on examination, he has uh, normal blood pressure or borderline blood pressure, an elevated heart rate of 125, which is irregular to irregular, and an elevated BMI of 32. His ECG shows atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. And preliminary investigation, including echocardiography, thyroid function, uh, were normal, and then he was card cardioverted chemically with vernicalant and discharged home. So this would be the type of patient where we would say he has low atrial fibrillation, uh, and uh, it really a, a term that we should be kind of moving away from nowadays because atrial fibrillation often either has a genetic component or um, has a multiple risk factors that are uh, about to uh, uh, progress or uh, uh, are already there uh, when the patient presents with AF. So which of these will be the most likely to have the greatest impact on preventing the progression of atrial fibrillation in this patient? Is it investigating him and treating him for obstructive sleep apnea alone, a weight loss of 5%, enrolling him in marathon training, uh, just doing an AF ablation and treating him as lone AF, or enrolling him in an aggressive risk factor modification program in addition to regular follow-up with an EP? Obviously, from the type of title of my talk, you would guess the number five is the correct answer. Uh, so when we look at risk factors for atrial fibrillation, this is data from the Framingham Heart Study, uh, congestive heart failure is strongly associated with atrial fibrillation as well as male gender, but we look at traditional cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, uh, uh, elevated BMI, uh, and cigarette smoking are all uh, 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 somewhat associated with atrial fibrillation. And as a patient accumulates these risk factors over the years, if you look here in the, the, the yellow, uh, is uh, five risk factors versus the green, no risk factors. As a patient accumulates risk factors over the years, their risk of AFib increases. So you can postulate that uh, control of these risk factors may uh, reduce the, uh, the uh, incidence or the progression of atrial fibrillation. Uh, and uh, of more interest in recent uh, years, uh, there's been a lot of data about obesity and, and other risk factors that I'll mention. So uh, when we look at a, a obesity, there's a, a quite a strong association from the Firminger Heart Study. There was uh, evidence that AF increased, the risk of AF increased by 1.5 fold uh, with a 4% increase in AF with each unit of increase in BMI. And this was similarly seen in large studies uh, like the ARIC study where 17% of AF was related to an elevated BMI, only modest elevation. The Women's Health Initiative also showed this with a 12% increased risk for AF per uh, unit of BMI. So a linear association, a strong association of AF with obesity. And when you look at animal models of obesity, we see that there's both structural abnormalities, whether LVH, diastolic dysfunction, increased left atrial volume, and abnormal cellular uh, 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 changes uh, where we see uh, fibrosis as well as infiltration of fat, uh, both due to the presence of fat within the myocardium or adjacent to the myocardium has a deleterious effect on uh, the um, uh, uh, atrial myocardium. 
And we see that in uh, changes in the uh, atrial conduction and uh, vulnerability to AF. And you see, see these changes also uh, in patients with hypertension and uh, in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. In addition, obstructive sleep apnea patients have changes in their vagal and sympathetic tone that predispose to AF. And uh, patients with uh, diabetes uh, have more isolated cellular changes. But really, the same process is thought to occur uh, in uh, these different diseases uh, to some degree or another. So what about uh, sleep apnea? How strongly is it associated with AF? Well, uh, very strongly associated. In uh, one study of patients coming in for DC cardioversion versus controls, 50% of patients had AF. Uh, uh, patients with AF coming for DC cardioversion had sleep apnea. Uh, in patients presenting for AF ablation, even a higher proportion of those patients have sleep apnea. And the mechanism is thought to be uh, related to hypoxemia and hypercapnia, as well as surges in sympathetic tone, which uh, promote inflammation, LA uh, remodeling. How about atrial fibrillation exercise? Another area of interest in recent past well, observational, studies, observational studies show that there's actually an increased risk of AF in endurance athletes. So you actually can have too much of a good thing when it comes to exercise and AF. Moderate exercise has a favorable effect. And sedentary patients, as you would expect, have an increased risk of AF. When you look at this study from uh, uh, this um, questionnaire study from Sweden, uh, patients who had been practicing vigorous exercise, so like ultra marathoners, actually had an increased, a, a higher risk than patients who were doing uh, uh, no exercise. So moderate uh, and, and, and high intensity exercise reduce your risk, but really moderate to high exercise is probably uh, the best approach. So what about treatment of these risk factors? How can we intervene to uh, reduce uh, the risk of AF? This was a prospective study in patients who came for a pulmonary vein isolation. Patients who came for ablation. Some of them had sleep apnea and some of them didn't. And they looked at who was compliant with CPAP and who wasn't compliant with CPAP. Look at the two, the red and uh, blue lines. Well, these were patients who either did not have sleep apnea uh, or in uh, the red line is patients who had sleep apnea, uh, came for ablation, and they were using CPAP. And they did just as well as patients who did not have sleep apnea. 72% of them were free from AF a year later. You look at patients who did not have ablation or patients who had sleep apnea, had ablation, but were not using CPAP. Well, they uh, did uh, 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 just as bad. Only 36% of them uh, remained uh, uh, in sinus rhythm. So uh, really uh, not using uh, CPAP uh, in a patient with sleep apnea, has, uh, it really nullifies the benefit of an ablation. Um, so looking at obesity and intervention on obesity, well, this was looked at, uh, one of the most interesting studies was the legacy study. Uh, this was a prospective study, very few randomized control studies in, in any of these areas. Uh, so that's one really limiting factor um, uh, into the data in this area. Uh, but this group from uh, Australia, uh, uh, Prosh Sanders, that really have published a, a great amount in this area. So uh, the legacy trial took 100, 825 patients, uh, enrolled them in a weight management clinic, followed them up for five years, and divided the weight loss into uh, patients who lost more than 10% of their weight patients who lost less than 3% of their weight and patients who were in between 3 to 9% of their weight. They not only looked at how much weight they lost, but they also followed what the weight trend or fluctuation of their weight. So when we look at these patients, patients before without ablation and without medication, uh, if they had lost uh, more than 10% of their weight, well, about half of them had remained in sinus rhythm after five years. While patients who did not lose any weight, only 13% uh, remained free of atrial fibrillation. So really did significantly worse uh, if patients did not lose any weight. A modest improvement if they lost weight were really still quite poor outcomes. However, when you add ablation and antiarrhythmics, patients do reasonably well when, you, uh, when they've lost more than 10% of their weight. 86% remain free of AF. Uh, patients who've lost a moderate amount of weight 65% of, of them remain free of AF. So really have an, there's a linear um, or a dose response effect with the more weight that is lost, the better patients do. Patients who did not lose any weight uh, or gained weight, really their effect was similar to patients who had just lost weight alone, uh, 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 you know, even after antiarrhythmics and after ablation. So uh, there's a, a really strong added effect to antiarrhythmics and ablation in preventing uh, uh, AF recurrence.
Uh, and not only that, but linear weight loss. So here in the red line, patients who had a linear weight loss as opposed to a fluctuating weight loss uh, did much better. And in patients who had significant fluctuations, so here they look in the red line is patients who had more than 5% weight loss, weight fluctuation when they lost weight, even though they lost weight, they really didn't do that much better. Uh, the reverse AF study looked at um, uh, patients uh, in the legacy trial uh, over a long-term follow-up, and they uh, compared how they did as far as how their AF progressed. So about 60% of each group, the group one less than 3%, two, three to 9%, and group three more than 10% weight loss, uh, they looked at their um, uh, the proportion of, when, of them who went from one type of atrial fibrillation to another and as you would expect, the uh, group uh, one who did not lose much weight or gained weight, well, a significant amount of them progressed from paroxysmal to persistent, 48%. Okay, so about half of them progressed uh, in, a, in their AF stage. However, when you look at patients in the group three, the reverse happened. Patients were going from persistent to paroxysmal. That's 36%. 50% were at free of atrial fibrillation. So patients did better. Uh, significantly with, with these lifestyle changes, with the weight loss changes. The same group then looked at uh, aggressive risk factor modification, similar results. Again, uh, progress, pro, prospective study looking at a, a multidisciplinary approach, including risk factor management and weight loss. Patients really did great after uh, 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 multiple procedures for uh, uh, AF ablation after two years follow-up. The CardioFit study um, looked at exercise, uh, also by the same group, and they divided a, a group of 300 patients into patients who had, at baseline, had a low, uh, less than 85% predicted of their cardiorespiratory fitness adequate, between 86 to 100% uh, cardiorespiratory, predicted cardiorespiratory fitness, and high, more than 100%, so very fit patients. And they also looked at how these patients changed over time. Did they improve their fitness by more than two metabolic equivalents or not. And um, what they saw in that is that patients who were who already were quite fit uh, did better overall, uh, stayed free from AF. Um, uh, this is without ablation, you know, 70% of them stayed free from AF. When you add AF ablation or antiarrhythmics to this, they do even better, about 90%. And even moderate exercise or moderate fitness uh, also has a very favorable uh, uh, prognosis. Um, when you look at patients who became fitter during the study, they did a lot better. So patients who improved their cardiovascular fitness by more than two METs uh, with ablation, with antiarrhythmics, you know, more than 90% stayed free from AF. So really powerful effect of uh, uh, improving cardio uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, final point about lifestyle and AF, alcohol or moderate alcohol intake or modest alcohol intake was thought not to affect atrial fibrillation. This was a study that was uh, done in the New England Journal, uh, a randomized study that looked at 140 patients, reduced their intake significantly from 16 to 2 drinks a week versus 16 to 14 drinks a week. Uh, and they saw a significant change and abstinence was even more powerful in uh, preventing or reducing the AF burden, which is something that we're really looking into uh, measuring AF in a more accurate uh, manner rather than just AF freedom. So AF thought to be really uh, not as strong a risk factor, but also something to consider. So uh, it, important to consider lifestyle risk factor modification just as much as the other pillars of AF. So this is the fourth uh, uh, pillar of AF management in addition to anticoagulation rate control and rhythm control. This is now in the guidelines and the ACC guidelines. Um, and uh, really, I like the slide because it, it demonstrates that management of the AF patient is a multifaceted approach. You're managing AF, but you're also, uh, you know, it's important to refer the patient uh, to all these various uh, uh, clinics to manage their other risk factors, uh, improve their exercise tolerance um, uh, and uh, uh, their weight. Uh, so in conclusion, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, traditional cardiovascular risk factors play a central role in development of atrial fibrillation, management of obesity and sleep apnea, uh, as well as improved fitness and aggressive risk factor modification can have a significant effect on AF burden and progression. And a multidisciplinary approach to AF risk factor modification is essential to improve outcomes. I'll leave you the quote for, on $100 from Benjamin Franklin, uh, or uh, quote worth $100 from Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al-Jabri, for this excellent uh, review.
uh, and uh, uh, an overview of the impact of lifestyle modifications in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. We will have uh, the opportunity to discuss and ask some questions after Dr. Wozni's presentation. So I want to remind uh, the participants and the audience, please, uh, if you have any questions, do post them. We will go through those questions and then uh, we'll address the panel to discuss the issues that you might have. Uh, second, I would like to, uh, it's uh, an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Wazni. Dr. Wazni is the section head of uh, cardiac electrophysiology uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he will be talking to us about something that is very important that we have come to realize uh, in the last few years, the importance of timing for intervention in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. He was actually the uh, global principal investigator for one of the studies that uh, he conducted and ended up in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm sure that we will hear about it. Um, Dr. Wazni. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to present on, um, uh, on uh, first-line ablation for proximal AFib. The official title in your uh, program is Revisiting uh, rhythm control versus rate control and we will go over that uh, too in the presentation uh, we're going to be focusing mostly on stop af first early af and cryo first <clears throat> ablation studies which were uh, recently published these are my disclosures the stop af first was funded by medtronic but we did an independent statistical review here at the cleveland clinic i'm also a consultant and speaker for bison's webster and boston scientific so uh, in background, uh, sinus rhythm is more difficult to restore as atrial fibrillation progresses. So this is the concept of AFib begets AFib and sinus begets sinus. Progression of atrial fibrillation is associated with a higher rate of cardiovascular admissions, heart failure, hospitalizations, mortality, as well as reduced quality of life. Early intervention with catheter ablation may improve long-term efficacy and prevention of disease progression. This is a very important study that was published uh, last year, <clears throat> in the fall of last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's called the East AF Net study. And this was a study about air early atrial fibrillation defined as a diagnosis made within the last 12 months. And it's in patients of uh, also 75 years of age or older. And this study <clears throat> is what made us rethink uh, this issue of uh, rhythm versus rate control. Because in this study, as you can see here, uh, the patients were randomized to usual care versus rhythm control. And it's very important to notice that early rhythm control, and this was with either antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation, was much better than usual care in terms of death from cardiovascular causes, stroke, or hospitalization with worsening of heart failure or acute coronary syndrome. So this is very important. So unlike what uh, we have been taught in the past from the AFFIRM and RACE trials. This study, which is a very large study in the New England Journal, as you can see, over 2,500 patients randomized, is a very, actually, um, yes. Um, it's very important to note that early rhythm control was much better than usual care. The, the, uh, the key here is that early rhythm control. So you can't wait 10 years and then decide that now I want to restore rhythm in those patients. Uh, it's too late. We have to act soon after, or within a year, the study tells us, of diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. This concept we've also worked on before, and uh, there is a concept called diagnosis to ablation time and recurrence of AFib. So this is a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. I'll start actually by our own study here in the middle uh, by Dr. Hussein and the rest of our group. This was not a meta-analysis, this was our own uh, patients. And we showed very clearly here that if we ablate within one year of diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, the success rate is much better than if you wait more than one year. So that's what this slide is showing. Now, if you go to the left of that, you will see that um, in all these studies that were uh, studied in the, in the meta-analysis, any ablation before one year, patients do much better than if you wait uh, more than one year. And this is the same thing here on the right uh, of the slide. So diagnosis to ablation time is a critical 
um, concept now in AFib ablation. This was the STOP AF uh, first study, which was published in uh, November in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in this study, we randomized patients to cryoablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs, again, early AF. And uh, we wanted to show that ablation is superior to antiarrhythmic drugs and it is also safe. We monitored patients using 12 lead ECGs and Holter monitors. And uh, we looked uh, for success. Success was defined as freedom from acute procedural failure, any su subsequent AFib surgery or ablation, and also no atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, or atrial flutter, and no cardioversions and no class one or three drug use. The endpoints, the safety endpoints, were uh, included within seven days. A, TIA, stroke, major bleeding, myocardial infarction, vascular complication, or within 30 days, significant pericardial effusion, and within 12 months, symptomatic coronary vein stenosis, atrial esophageal fistula, or unresolved phrenic nerve injury. This is the patient disposition. We randomized 203 patients. I'm not going to go through all their medications, um, but as you can see here at the end, we had 102 patients in the cryo balloon arm and 91 patients in the antiarrhythmic drug arm. And these are the patient characteristics. They were very similar. The age was around 60. And they had the usual uh, Chad's vast uh, risk factors. And this is the primary efficacy endpoint. And, um, and this is basically the results of the study. As you can see, the success rate with ablation, freedom from AFib flutter or ATAC at one year was 75, almost 75% in the ablation group and only 45% in the drug group. And then how about safety? Um, really, there were minimal safety events. There was one significant pericardial effusion within 30 days and one MI within seven days. One more patient who was in the antiarrhythmic drug arm but ended up getting a, an ablation had a major vascular complication. So all in all, a very safe procedure. How about quality of life? Quality of life improved. So uh, this is the a AFib uh, uh, quality of life score. It improved uh, much more in the ablation arm versus the antiarrhythmic drug arm. So this is the baseline was 57 and improved to 92.2 in the uh, ablation arm. Another study that was also published in the same uh, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine is the cryoablation for drug therapy for AFib. Uh, it's called the Early AFib Ablation Study by Dr. Andrade and his group from Canada. This was 303 patients randomized to ablation versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy. All of them had loop recorders. And then the secondary endpoints were symptomatic arrhythmia, AFib burden, and quality of life. And you can see here ablation was much more successful at maintaining sinus rhythm than the antiarrhythmic drug therapy. You will notice that the success rate is less than what we reported, a little less, than what we reported in our study, but this is because these patients had loop recorders, so it was detecting AFib more frequently. And then finally, this is the cryo first ablation. This is still not published, but was presented at AHA. And this is a study from Europe where 220 patients were randomized to ablation versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy. These are the key inclusion criteria and key exclusion criteria over here. But again, this is early atrial fibrillation. And uh, in it, it was very clear that ablation performs so much better than uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. So more than 50% risk reduction in any atrial arrhythmia recurrence compared to antiarrhythmic drugs over 12 months in cry first study. Uh, in that study, there were only three uh, phrenic nerve palsies which recovered. Uh, how about the quality of life? Quality of life. Uh, was so much better in the ablation group versus the drug therapy group. So you can see here that uh, most of the um, quality of life improvement happened at the three months, so after the planking period, and it continued to be better in the cryoablation group. So in conclusion, um, early atrial fibrillation ablation is much better than antiarrhythmic drug therapy. The success rate uh, can be around 75%, and uh, it's a very safe procedure. In our study in the STOP-AF, we had two primary safety endpoints in the 
early AF, they had three phrenic nerves, and in the cryo, actually, they had no, no um, complications. So I think it is time now to revisit this uh, rhythm versus rate control. I think if you have a patient who has symptoms related to atrial fibrillation, you should try rhythm control first with antiarrhythmic drugs if the patient doesn't want to have an ablation. But now with the three uh, studies that I just uh, discussed with you, ablation can be used first line. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wazni, for uh, uh, this uh, excellent review. I think this is very important information uh, that uh, we are getting uh, over the past few years about the importance of, uh, of early intervention in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. So again, I'm going to invite the uh, audience to uh, submit their questions so that we can uh, discuss them. Uh, but let me uh, let me start myself with uh, with a question actually for uh, uh, both uh, presenters. So if I'm an average cardiologist and I see patients with atrial fibrillation, and here I am, I'm seeing a patient with some symptomatic atrial fibrillation with a BMI of around 30 to 33, um, sedentary lifestyle. Um, what do I tell this patient? Do I tell this patient, based on what I heard from Dr. Wozni, that since you have atrial fibrillation, let's go ahead and do an early intervention because you can have a better outcome with early intervention, or I should address first the lifestyle modifications because from what we heard from Dr. al Jabiri, addressing lifestyle modifications with the weight reduction and uh, improved uh, cardiovascular fitness, you can achieve almost uh, an, uh, 75 to 80% uh, atrial fibrillation freedom uh, without the need for having an ablation. So which one comes first? And I have to tell this patient something, uh, where do we go and in which direction do we go? If I would appreciate if Dr. al Jabri, I start with you, uh, and then we'll go to Dr. Wozni and see here uh, and hear his uh, side of the story. Uh, I think it's important to uh, look at the patient, the atrial fibrillation patient as a whole. Uh, I think uh, you could do ablation alone uh, in this patient and, uh, you know, he might feel well initially, but when we look at the long-term follow-up, if we don't aggressively treat his risk factors, then his long-term outcome or his recurrence for atrial fibrillation is going to be quite high. So uh, the way I look at it is if the patient is extremely symptomatic uh, it's and, 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 you know, they're failing antiarrhythmic therapy quite early, then I would take a very aggressive approach to managing their atrial fibrillation, even if they're still obese and they haven't treated sleep apnea. Uh, however, if, you know, they're mildly symptomatic and there's a lot of room to work, I might aggressively treat the risk factors and reevaluate, uh, you know, within a couple of months. Uh, I certainly wouldn't wait for too long with the presence of atrial fibrillation without addressing it, um, you know, with an antiarrhythmic or, uh, uh, or ablation if, if the patient is, uh, you know, symptomatic. I, I wouldn't just leave them without, without managing uh, their AF. Uh, but I think, you know, these, these two, uh, they're, they're kind of two parts to the, to the puzzle. You really have to aggressively manage the risk factors and manage the arrhythmia. Uh, but if you leave one or the other, your, your outcome is not going to be great. If we looked at all these studies, uh, the patients who only had lifestyle uh, modification, you know, their, their maintenance in sinus rhythm was only about 40 to, to 70%. They never really got to the 80, 90%. It was those two strategies together. Dr. Wozni. Yes. Yeah, so I th thank you, Dr. Jabra, and uh, thank you, Walid, for the introduction. So I, I totally agree. And I think uh, the most important thing we can do with um, to our patients actually have a good discussion with them. So before we start any of this, we, we set the expectations and we explain that, okay, we are going to manage your atrial fibrillation, which entails risk factor modification, uh, whether it's going to be weight loss, decrease alcohol intake, address their sleep apnea, and we are also going to control their atrial fibrillation. So we do those together, but it's very important for us to articulate this to the patients. And so that they, and we should also make sure that they understood what we said, meaning that, yes, we are going to address the AFib, whether with a cardioversion, antiarrhythmic, or then an ablation, but also at the same time, we are going to refer you for weight loss therapy, we are going to refer you for uh, some rehab if needed, and we are going to refer you to get checked for sleep apnea, and you're going to use hopefully a CPAP 
uh, if needed. So once we get this discussion out of the way and we keep reinforcing it over time, I think the patients will, will get it. Now, sometimes we do not express the information to the patient. We know that we are going to do it or we want to address it, but we don't explicitly say it and uh, make it clear to the patient that that is the plan. And I think if we start by that, uh, then uh, the patients do so much better psychologically and also uh, physiologically. Thank you, Osama. And, and this is a very important uh, point that uh, uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation is a shared decision making and the patient is a part of this decision. And uh, we really have to give them all the information that we have so that they can actually be part of this decision. And I think this is very important. Um, my next question uh, is for Dr. Wozni. So uh, I know that now with the newest information that we are being advocate for early intervention and, and, and properly so with ablation, actually better than with antiarrhythmic medication. Can you comment on how much atrial fibrillation does the patient need to have before we say, yeah, let's go ahead and have an ablation? Is, it, is there a difference between having five, 10 minutes of atrial fibrillation every couple of weeks? Uh, do we need an aggressive intervention there with an ablation versus somebody who is having, say, atrial fibrillation on a daily basis? How much AFib and what is the burden of AFib that will click the trigger to say, yes, we need to do an aggressive intervention? Or is it all comers with AFib? No, so, well, this is a very, very important question. And, you know, it's a, it's a tricky one because we really don't have a very good answer. So there, on one point, you know, the, the most important aspect or the reason we do an ablation is for symptom relief. So you could have a patient who only has 15, 20 minutes of AFib every day, but they're very symptomatic. And then this person, I would think we should, you know, address with a, an, an ablation. But then you'll have a patient who actually develops AFib but doesn't get out of it unless you do a cardioversion, but it happens only once or twice, say, uh, you know, once maybe every couple of years. So in that patient, even though you really need to intervene to get them out of AFib, they only need a cardioversion every couple of years. Uh, they only go into AFib every couple of years. Actually, I do have a patient like that. And, and then we struggle with this question. So then we have to rely on other things, such as is the atrial fibrillation causing some structural changes? Is the LV starting to dilate? Is the ejection fraction starting to decrease? And then we would offer an ablation. So really now it's for quality of life. So the patient who has only 10, 15 minute uh, episode once a week, I think that person will probably appreciate getting an ablation and not having AFib more than the person who gets a persistent episode that lasts you know, six to seven days and you cardiovert them, but it only happens once every two years. So I, it has to be a tailored approach and it has to make sense on, in what we are trying to achieve in those patients. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is a, a clear answer that uh, it is not just a one size fits all, but it's mostly a tailored approach depending on the patient's uh, uh, burden of atrial fibrillation and their symptoms. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, uh, first one is atrial fibrillation ablation is not widely and readily available in our part of the world. Uh, in that case, uh, what do you recommend first, light, first line action for new onset AFib, whether rate control with rate limiting agent or rhythm control with antiarrhythmic agents? Uh, so if uh, ablation, if I understand the, 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 the question right, if ablation is not readily available and you have a patient with AFib, uh, do you recommend an antiarrhythmic approach for rhythm control or just a rate control strategy? So um, if I may, I'll start with that one. So the East AFNET study, which was published in the New England Journal, showed clearly, clearly with hard endpoints that rhythm control is superior to rate control. So we have to try to achieve rhythm control in our patients. Uh, and if ablation is not available, then cardioversion uh, for, to get them back into normal rhythm and then an antiarrhythmic drug to maintain normal rhythm all on, about, uh, on a foundation of risk factor modification. So it's going to be very important to work together. And sometimes you, you will find that uh, once you, we have risk factor modification, uh, 
that uh, patients maintain sinus rhythm with the help of an antiarrhythmic drug. Now, if you don't want to immediately start with an antiarrhythmic drug, that's fine. So we always say, let us watch the pattern. And this is what we do in our own practice. Let's see the pattern of atrial fibrillation after the first cardioversion and see what happens. But what I don't recommend is to keep the patient in, in atrial fibrillation uh, and then see what happens, because we know what's, what's going to happen. They're going to have worse outcomes. So that's very clear. So get them out of AFib. Maybe this patient is destined to have AFib only once every two or three years. And then look at the pattern and decide on how to move forward based on that. So if I understand right, and also Dr. Aljabri, you might uh, uh, pitch in here. If I understand you right, if I have somebody who is relatively young, 65 years of age, who comes in with atrial fibrillation and I can control his heart rate and render him asymptomatic, uh, am I okay keeping him at a rate control or you still advocate going on with an ablation for that patient? So again, before East AFnet, we thought that yes, we are okay, but now we're not okay. So now we really have to strive to get them back into normal rhythm. If, first of all, you're comfortable with the therapy because some patients, you know, some physicians also are not comfortable with giving antiarrhythmic drugs or they are not comfortable in monitoring antiarrhythmic drugs. So we don't want to put the patient at risk because of our own, uh, you know, um, not lack of, but you know, our, our own issues with, with those medications. Um, but it is clear now with that rhythm control is better than rate control, even if we render the patient asymptomatic because ACE AF net showed that with the rate control, there is a higher risk of heart failure, uh, hospitalization, there is a higher risk of stroke and also higher risk of uh, mortality. One last question for Dr. Al Jabri. Uh, in our end of the world, is is ablation done only for persistent or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? And you can we might comment just quickly, Dr. Al Jabri, about uh, what is the setup uh, at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in terms of uh, having a multifaceted approach to patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, so uh, we certainly do ablation for uh, paroxysmal patients. That's our primary group of patients that we focus on. Uh, that's really patients that have the best outcomes, but we do take patients with persistent atrial fibrillation as well. So uh, I think it's a similar approach as we see in the West. Uh, one comment I wanted to make uh, is that we often get patients referred to us a little later than you would expect. And that's really disappointing because we've kind of missed the boat. You know, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the great data that Dr. Wesney uh, 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 presented was based on early intervention of atrial fibrillation. Uh, we often get these patients when they once they've become persistent and the outcomes are significantly less favorable. Uh, so it's disappointing to get a patient when he's already, uh, you know, been in AF for a couple of years. The chances of success uh, with uh, atrial remodeling, both structural and electrical, uh, really are decreased. Uh, now the setup. Uh, as to your second question, the setup at our uh, our clinic, we have a, a dedicated weekly atrial fibrillation clinic. We try to refer all our patients with atrial fibrillation. You know, whether it's an 85 year old uh, elderly lady or or a, a first episode of AFib in a young man, and um, uh, you know, we have a we have an excellent sleep apnea uh, a, a physician who's interested in sleep apnea and AFib. We have a cardiac rehabilitation center and obesity clinic. So we've got kind of all the different. Um, uh, uh, referral services that we can send our patients to to manage their uh, their comorbidities, uh, and it works very nicely. But uh, you know, the atrial fibrillation clinic, really, the center of the atrial fibrillation is just me and Dr. Almuti. Uh, you know, uh, but then we we kind of uh, uh, then refer the patient on to all these different uh, services. So you really have to have somebody who's who's a, a, a center center person. We don't have. A lot of nurse practitioners like you have in the U.S., but uh, you know this is something that could be nurse-led or uh, uh, physician-led, depending on the resources that you have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so this uh, brings the, the this section of questions and answers to to an end. So for the sake of time, we're gonna go ahead and move on. Dr. Al Jabiri, I think uh, you go ahead. Yep. So uh, for the next talk, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Khaled Al Mati. He's uh, uh, my dear colleague and friend, and the uh, uh, the uh, department head of the cardiac electrophysiology at uh, Cleveland Clinic. He's been there since uh, the founding of the hospital. 
and he's a regional leader in remote monitoring and also leads our uh, left atrial appendage occlusion uh, program. Uh, and he's going to talk about, uh, he's going to present a patient to us with atrial fibrillation and recurrent gastrointestinal bleeds and what would be the next step to manage this patient. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today's topic uh, is a very important one. It's very relevant uh, to our practices, both uh, in the Middle East region and beyond. Uh, it is uh, a phenomenon or a dilemma that faces uh, cardiologists and electrophysiologists worldwide. And today we'll be uh, discussing it. And specifically, we're talking about people who have atrial fibrillation, uh, needing anticoagulation, but having recurrent gastrointestinal bleeding issues. I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. So the learning objectives that I would like to get through this presentation uh, the first is to appreciate the current management strategies for atrial fibrillation uh, in patients with concurrent high risks of bleeding and stroke. The second one is to recognize some of the very common improper management strategies that we see for this kind of population with AFib who bleed on anticoagulation. And finally, to be familiar with the role and indications for left atrial appendage occlusion devices uh, as it stands in uh, 2021. So I start with a patient case, which is the easiest way to get us all on the same page. So I uh, made a case with a 76-year-old woman who has permanent atrial fibrillation. Her comorbidities include diabetes, hypertension, and she had a prior TIA. She has suffered multiple episodes of GI bleeding while on NOAX. Most recently, she was on epixaban 5 milligrams twice daily. She has had two hospitalizations in recent months for this problem, required transfusion three times over the past year, and she's had repeat upper and lower endoscopy that have failed to localize the bleeding source. Uh, cardiology was consulted on the most recent admission to aid in the determination of the next appropriate steps in the management of this patient. So her most recent hemoglobin is 8.7. Her platelets are fine, they're 204. Current medications include uh, bisoprolol, atorvastatin, metformin, and amlodipine. There are no current uh, issues with bleeding at this time as we speak, uh, because she's off anticoagulation. And her hemoglobin and hematocrit has been stable for the past one week. Her weight, which is important, as you will see, is 70 kilograms. Her serum creatinine, also important, is 1.2 milligrams per deciliter, which calculates based on her uh, findings to about the GFR, estimated GFR of 44 uh, milliliter per minute uh, per uh, body surface area unit. So what is, this is the question that I'm gonna try to, uh, to address in this uh, presentation what is the best appropriate next step in this management? So you have this elderly lady who's bled over and over on anticoagulation. And these are uh, significant bleeds uh, requiring transfusions. And importantly, no source has been identified for the bleeding. So no actual fixing of the problem has been undertaken. So do we, as happens often, uh, and what we see, stop all anticoagulation as the patient's risk of life-threatening bleeding outweighs the benefits of oral anticoagulation for stroke prevention? Do we just take away everything and just leave her alone? Do we avoid NOACs and instead uh, go back in time and start her on warfarin and aim for a lowish uh, INR of borderline low about 1.7 to 2? Do we restart apixaban but lower the dose, go from five milligrams BID to 2.5 milligrams BID? Do we switch her to the Vigitran, 75 milligrams BID, try something different? Do we start the patient on aspirin or clopidogrel and avoid all NOACs and all vitamin K antagonists altogether? Do we refer her for a surgical left atrial appendage ligation? Maybe there's a good surgeon nearby and they know how to do this with a minimally invasive uh, type of approach. And then after that, we can avoid anticoagulation altogether. Or do we refer the patient for a left atrial uh, percutaneous appendage occlusion procedure? So we'll go through uh, each 
and uh, every one of those options and see uh, if we have some comments about it. But before that, I wanna present some of the major challenges that I have seen and my colleagues have seen in the management of this uh, kind of a scenario. So one of the major challenges is the widespread practice of avoiding or withholding stroke prophylaxis, uh, NOACs these days, or anticoagulation in general in elderly patients with atrial fibrillation, usually for the perceived reason that they're too frail or too, uh, too high risk to bleed. The second major challenge is the widespread practice, and this is a worldwide phenomenon, of non-adherence to NOAC dosing guidelines. And this usually happens in the form of underdosing. The third item, the third challenge, is the persistent practice of accepting the use of aspirin in 2021 for stroke prevention in AF patients who don't have another indication for uh, aspirin. We're not talking about here about atrial fibrillation complicating ACS. Here we're talking about just using aspirin for the prevention of stroke in patients who have atrial fibrillation. And then we have the limited availability of non-pharmacologic options for stroke prevention in AF patients. And here I'm talking about uh, the few uh, sites, at least in our region here in the Middle East, offering left atrial appendage occlusion as an option for stroke prevention. And finally, uh, the occurrence of strokes, even in patients who uh, are properly anticoagulated and don't have an, uh, uh, any bleeding issues. Believe it or not, there is a significant percentage of patients uh, that have strokes despite being on anticoagulation. And those also present a major challenge. So let's go back to the case that I presented, this 76 year old lady. What are some of the important questions in her case? Well, uh, what is this patient's risk of stroke without proper treatment? Uh, we calculated her chads vasc score to seven based on her uh, important factors. What is her risk of another bleed? Is her bleed fixable? Well, we, we saw in this case that they have uh, scoped her multiple times and nothing can be fixed, but this is an important question to answer when this, question, when this issue comes up. Can she tolerate a short period of anticoagulation and or lifelong antiplatelet therapy uh, if left atrial appendage occlusion is to be considered? Uh, or does she have an absolute contraindication to any, any use of any medications, even single, uh, single uh, antiplatelet uh, medication? So let's go ahead and look at, at the options that were presented. So the, the first option that we presented was to stop all anticoagulation and just leave the lady alone. Well, as I said, this lady's chads vasc score is seven. This gives her uh, an, uh, a risk score, a uh, risk of stroke per year of about 10%. That's pretty high, especially that this lady did already have a TIA. So this is, you know, leaving her alone may uh, prevent bleeding, but she is extremely high risk for, for having another stroke. 10% per year is, is a significant number. You're over two, three, four, five years, you're talking about a very high percentage. Uh, although bleeding is, is not easy to manage, but it's usually easier to manage than having a debilitating stroke where patient doesn't make it in time for an intervention and then they end up uh, paralyzed or worse. So leaving the patient alone without uh, any protection is not the best option, I would argue, especially in 2021, as we have other uh, treatment options available. How about the second option that was presented, which is to avoid NOACs and to start the warfarin, aiming for an INR of 1.7 to 2.0? Well, in the next few slides, I'll be using extensively the guidelines to, to guide this discussion. And you see that in the uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and similarly in the European guidelines, there is a strong recommendation for using NOACs over uh, warfarin and vitamin K antagonists in general, because they uh, are at least non-inferior and potentially superior as far as protecting from stroke, and because they're associated with a lower risk of serious bleeding. So in this patient uh, who already had a TIA and had a bleed, you know, switching to a, vi a vitamin K antagonist and aiming for a subtherapeutic INR is just asking for trouble. We're probably gonna not protect her from stroke and still make her 
uh, at risk for bleeding. So this option also is not a reasonable option. The third option was to restart apixaban, but at a lower dose of 2.5 milligram BID. Well, this is a bigger problem that we see, uh, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world, which is to cut the dose and hope for the best. And what I would like to say here is that going from five milligrams twice a day to, to 2.5 milligrams twice a day is a 50% reduction in the dose. This is a significant uh, reduction in the dose. And what it does uh, is that it leaves the patient uh, unprotected from stroke. These are the guidelines from the company itself. It says, and by the way, you need two out of three. You need age over 80, you need weight, under 60 or a serum creatinine 1.5 and above. And you need two out of these three, if they are present, then you go to 2.5 milligrams BID. Well, in this case, the lady is 76 years old. She weighs 70 kilos and her serum creatinine is 1.2. So lowering the dose for her would just be asking for trouble. Uh, it would not protect her and it would not be based on any kind of recommendation that is uh, available at present. How about switching to the big trans 75 milligrams BID? Well, sometimes, you know, switching to another medication, another NOAC may be an option. However, you know, uh, the dosing of the big trans is uh, based on renal function. So this lady's GFR, as we mentioned, is over 40. So she does not qualify, she does not fit in this criteria of 15 to 30, where we would reduce the dose to 75 milligrams twice a day. Again, we would leave the patient unprotected and we would not be following the guidelines that are recommended by the manufacturer and by major studies that have looked at this matter. And this slide here shows that this is a systematic review that was published in 2020, looking at uh, the individual uh, NOACs, the Bigotran, Epixaban, and Rivaroxaban, and then all of them combined. And you see that this phenomenon of underdosing uh, Overdosing to some extent, but mostly underdosing is very significant. And you can see specifically with apixaban, in some studies, the majority of patients are underdosed. And overall, the number is, is very significant. So a lot of colleagues are not following the guidelines for dose reduction. And this is you know, a smaller issue for the bigotran and rivaroxaban, but it is still an issue. And it is still a very important issue. In this slide here, another very important finding, and you will see here that uh, the first column is for major bleeding, major bleeding in, in all four slides, and it is for the individual NOACs and for all NOACs together. What is important here is that, okay, so if you overdose, then your major bleeding risk is higher, but you will see that even if you underdose, which is the middle uh, uh, bar in each of these uh, graphs, underdosing still leads to the same major bleeding as much as proper dosing. But at the same time, you will see in the second set of, of bars that systemic embolism and stroke is higher in those groups. So you end up with a very bad combination of having a higher risk of stroke and no significant lowering of the risk of bleeding. So inappropriate dosing, specifically underdosing, is not a good option for our patients. How about start the patient on aspirin or clopidogrel and avoid NOACs or vitamin K antagonists altogether? Well, the, the guidelines are pretty clear about this. You know, aspirin and clopidogrel, whether individually or in combination, do not uh, suffice for stroke prevention and are not to be used. You know, the, the American guidelines took out the aspirin, but the European guidelines go even a step further saying that this monotherapy or dual therapy with antiplatelet agents just should not be used, period. So this is not uh, a proper option for our patient either. How about referring the patient for a surgical left atrial appendage ligation or excision to avoid anticoagulation? Well, you know, we know that the left atrial appendage is the source of uh, most clots, as I will show you in an upcoming slide. However, due to the tech, surgical techniques, you can never actually be sure that, the, that there's no stump and that, that there's no flow going in and out of the appendage. So the guidelines, the, these are the European guidelines, actually say that if you do the surgical occlusion or ex, ex, exclusion of the left atrial appendage, 
you continue anticoagulation. So this would not, again, be a good option in this case. How about refer for left atrial appendage occlusion? And here I'm talking about percutaneous occlusion. Well, you know, our understanding of uh, uh, prothrombotic mechanisms in AP have evolved tremendously. And it's now thought of as a major uh, inflammatory or endothelial dysfunction type of a thing, not related just to a specific location. But we also know that 91% of all left atrial uh, clots come from the appendage. Uh, this is from all surgical literature. So th the left atrial appendage, by, by occluding it properly, you do actually lower the risk of uh, stroke and systemic embolism. And this was borne out by many studies. The available, the two major available uh, tools that we have to us are the Watchman device and the Emulet device. Both of them work similarly to fully occlude the ostium of the left atrial appendage. And over time, you have endothelialization of the uh, opening. And after a while, you can suffice with a single antiplatelet agent. Uh, initially, however, there is a need for some anticoagulation in the first three to six months, plus or minus antiplatelet agent. The, the combination depends on the operator, on the guidelines, but this is not the option for somebody with an active bleed or an, an absolute contraindication to any kind of uh, anticoagulation or uh, antiplatelet therapy. So who, who is a possible indication for this kind of treatment? It's patients with high risk of uh, or recurrent bleeding while on NOAX, uncontrolled hypertension, coagulopathy, severe renal or hepatic disease, vascular disease or malformation, high probability of frequent and severe uh, trauma, such as the elderly or patients, or patients with epilepsy. Uh, also, patients who have ischemic strokes despite being on proper anticoagulation, high probability of therapeutic noncompliance, intolerance to NOAC, which happens in a significant number of patients. Who should not get this kind of treatment? People who have a low risk of stroke and thromboembolism. This is not uh, just let me get this and not be on any medications kind of an approach yet. Maybe in the future, but not yet. Patients on oral anticoagulation without any bleeding issues. Other indications for oral, oral anticoagulation. So if somebody has a PE or a mechanical valve, there is no point of, of occluding the appendage because they still have to be on anticoagulation. Like I said, somebody with active bleeding, you cannot uh, do this to them. And a contraindication for transeptal function, something anatomic that basically prevents you from getting into the left atrium and then patients with moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So in conclusion, it's very important to adhere to NOAC dosing guidelines. Important to have different management strategies for patients with perceived risk of bleeding versus those with actual bleeding. So we shouldn't judge people just on their appearance, say, oh, he's too frail for this, she's too weak for anticoagulation. We deal with these differently than people with actual bleeding issues. There are legitimate treatment options for patients who present with high risk of bleeding and or actual bleeding and also high risk of stroke. No need to resort to inappropriate dose reduction or withholding of treatment altogether. Patients who cannot tolerate NOACs and or develop bleeding complications while on NOACs and or develop recurrent stroke while on NOACs may be candidates for left atrial appendage occlusion. And this left atrial appendage occlusion by catheter-based techniques is both feasible, relatively safe, and non-inferior to oral anticoagulation. These are the references relevant to this presentation. And with that, I conclude my study and my, I conclude my presentation and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, that was a, a good overview for uh, indication for uh, watchman uh, or left atrial appendage occlusion uh, device uh, therapy. Um, next, uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ayman Hussein. Uh, Dr. Hussein is uh, an electrophysiologist uh, with us at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he joined us uh, a few years back. Uh, Dr. Hussein uh, has been really very instrumental and very active in research. He has he's really uh, very much well published. Um, I, uh, I always say that he's a machine of writing papers. Uh, it's amazing how much his CV has grown. Um, and uh, he also co-directs uh, the uh, Atrial Fibrillation Center with me. And it's a pleasure to uh, 
uh, introduce him. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about something very important. What do we do with asymptomatic pre-excitation that we discover incidentally on the EKG? Uh, Ayman? Good evening, everyone. And thank you for uh, the organizer for uh, inviting me to participate in this webinar. My talk today is about asymptomatic pre-excitation on EKG and the role of further testing. So ventricular pre-excitation is typically a congenital uh, type uh, malformation, whereas uh, patients are born with an accessory conducting pathway. Normally, Conduction happens over the AV node to the Hispurkinji system and spreads over to the ventricles. But with the presence of an accessory pathway, early ventricular activation happens over the pathway due to the presence of this extra nodal conductive tissue between the atria and the ventricle. The pathways could be either right-sided or left-sided. And that may have an impact on how the pathway or how the pre-excitation actually looks on surface EKG. Here I have an example of a post-receptal pathway and because it's closer to the right side and as such the sinus node, here you have a clear evidence of the WPW or the pre-excitation pattern across all EKG leads. But we take here an example of a, an accessory pathway located on the left lateral uh, side. So it's a left lateral pathway. Here, you see the pre-excitation is very subtle. As a matter of fact, you barely see any sign of it uh, here. And the reason is the activation of this uh, of the ventricles in this case scenario happen primarily over the Hispurkinji system and the AV node. And by the time the accessory pathway is reached by the activating wavefront, the ventricle is already being activated via the Hispurkinji system, resulting as such in subtle pre-excitation pattern. Here I'm attaching actually a, an algorithm uh, that helps with localizing uh, accessory pathways based on certain criteria. I'll leave that for your, uh, for your reference. But generally speaking, for left lateral pathways, we have a, a, a ratio in D1 of an R greater than S, and or in lead one, we have either an isoelectric or a negative delta wave. On the other hand, Delta waves that is primarily negative in lead 2 could be an indication of a middle cardiac vein or coronary sinus uh, located uh, pathway. Again, I'll leave this uh, in the document here for your reference. Generally speaking, when we talk about uh, WPW patterns, it is thought that about 1 to 3 for every 1,000 individuals have it. So the, incident, the prevalence is about 0.1 to 0.3%. But we have also some uh, evidence that suggests that uh, studies in first degree relatives with WPW may be a slightly higher risk, whereas the prevalence is about 0.5%. In patients who have symptoms, whereas pre-excitation is resulting in either syncope or palpitations, uh, these are patients we call with the WPW syndrome. So, and otherwise, a syndrome is typically the presence of pre-excitation in addition to symptoms such as syncope or palpitations. And we know that in those symptomatic patients who have the WPW syndrome, that these patients are at increased risk of sudden cardiac death, which could be estimated about 4% over a lifetime. And in those patients with symptoms, either syncope or palpitations, risk stratification is typically done with EP testing, invasive EP testing, and with catheter ablation of the accessory pathway. So it is easy to manage those patients with symptoms because we have some indication already that that might be at risk, they're having symptoms, so we proceed with invasive testing and ablation. But on the other hand, it is 
thought, or we know, that about 65% of adolescents with pre-excitations are totally asymptomatic, which could be or could represent a clinically challenging scenario. In other words, we see a patient with an EKG showing pre-excitation, but in the absence of other symptoms, we don't really know sometimes what is the best treatment for these patients. Whereas the majority will remain asymptomatic over long-term follow-up, the rates of symptomatic arrhythmias development is, has been reported being as high as 20% over three, over three years in studies. And the risk applies to both uh, the development of uh, uh, supraventricular tachycardias, but what we worry about the most is the risk of sudden cardiac death. And this is primarily related to the risk of atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response eventually leading to ventricular fibrillation uh, due to conduction of those rapid beats of atrial fibrillation over the accessory pathway, resulting as such in sudden cardiac arrest. We know that the risk of sudden cardiac death in patients who are totally asymptomatic and who have pre-excitation is, as a matter of fact, a rare event. And we know that most patients who experience a sudden cardiac arrest who would have had some palpitations at some point. So the likelihood of a sudden cardiac death event happening in otherwise totally asymptomatic patient is very, very low. But that said, whenever we think that we have a, uh, a benign pathway or a weak integrate conducting pathway, it's always important to emphasize uh, symptoms uh, to patients. In other words, if we decide to manage conservatively, Patients need to be aware of the symptoms of SVT or syncope being red flags and being risk markers for further uh, risk, especially risk of sudden cardiac death. Generally speaking, the risk of uh, sudden cardiac death is estimated to about 0.2% per year. When it comes down to risk stratification, the main factor that decides or that correlates with the risk of sudden cardiac death is how weak or how strong uh, the integrate conducting properties of that pathway are. And here, actually, when when we when we uh, when we see that we have two maximally or two pre-excited RR intervals being 250 milliseconds or less apart, that could be a signal of a very uh, robust integrate conducting pathway. So we call that the SPRRI, or the shortest pre-excited RR interval on a surface EKG. Again, if it's less than 250 milliseconds, that could be a signal of a robust integrate conducting pathway, and as such, could be a signal of uh, the risk of development of ventricular fibrillation uh, in case AFib happens. But that said, that uh, interval or that finding has a very weak has a weak positive predictive value. On the other hand, it has a very good negative predictive value. So if the shortest pre-excited RR on EKG during AFib, or as a matter of fact, you know, during even invasive EP testing, when it's when the, 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 the pathway loses conduction at intervals greater than 250 milliseconds apart, that means that this would be a, uh, a good predictor of low risk of sudden cardiac death. But mostly it's about those conduction properties of the pathway, but there are some other factors that could determine the risk or lack of risk. We know that younger age can determine or can be a signal of a high risk, primarily because it's, you know, if it's, a, it's, a li it's a lifelong uh, exposure. If I take somebody who's 20 year old, versus somebody who is 80 year old and say they have the same exact uh, uh, properties of that accessory pathway, the risk for a 20 year old over li their lifetime is typically less than that risk for an 80 year old. It is also known or thought that men are at higher risk. Any patients who have inducible um, SVT or AF during uh, EP studies uh, are uh, thought to be at high risk of developing symptoms or sudden cardiac death. Patients who have multiple accessory pathways or Epstein malformation are also thought to be at high risk of developing symptoms or sudden
cardiac death. So how do we how do we risk stratif stratify? We typically start with non-invasive assessment. A non-invasive assessment includes EKG, holters, and a stress test. And we tend to perform uh, all of these in, in, in most patients. If on a surface EKG we have an AFib uh, and that shows a shorter, a shorter pre-excited RR interval greater than 250 millisecond, that again would be a signal of a uh, low uh, or a weak uh, integrate access, uh, conducting accessory pathway and as such a marker of lower risk. If we have a halter or EKG showing a intermittent loss of pre-excitation and sinus rhythm, that's also a, suggesting, or a suggestion of a lower risk of sudden cardiac death. And if on stress EKG testing, if we see abrupt and complete loss of uh, pre-excitation uh, during or early during exercise, that would be a uh, lower or indicator of, of, of lower risk. But in, in terms of like clinical decision making, this, this algorithm actually provide a, provides a good assessment. If we start with baseline EKG showing intermittent uh, pre-excitation, again, this is this is uh, this is marker of low risk. And in those scenarios, patients can be uh, followed uh, with uh, cardiology, uh, but they should be counseled regarding uh, symptoms and awareness uh, of symptoms because if they develop any symptoms, that put them in the uh, symptomatic category and as such WPW syndrome uh, increasing the risk of sudden cardiac death and necessitating or needing uh, invasive EP testing. So symptoms uh, should be, uh, patients should be become very well educated about the symptoms and the risk of those symptoms and what those symptoms would imply. On the other hand, patients who have persistent uh, manifest pre-excitation on, on baseline EKG, we do exercise stress testing and if they have abrupt and clear loss of uh, manifest pre-excitation, then just clinical follow-up and uh, counseling regarding symptom awareness. But in patients who have persistent or uncertain loss of manifestation or of manifest pre-excitation upon exercise testing, we typically proceed with uh, diagnostic uh, invasive EP testing for the most part. And on those EP studies, if we induce SVT or find out that there is AFib with a shorter, shortest uh, pre-excited RR interval being less than 250 millisecond, as such, uh, uh, including risk. In those patients, we typically proceed with ablation. On the other hand, if patients have a shortest pre-excited RR interval greater than 250 millisecond, and in the absence of inducible SVT, there are scenarios whereas we may still consider ablation, but that dep depends on, on patient, their comorbidities, or their characteristics, but also depending on the location of the pathway. So if in a young patient, let's say, you know, we have uh, no inducible SVT and the shortest pre-excited interval being greater than 250 millisecond, uh, but say the pathway is near the AV node, we don't want to take the risk of causing AV block and uh, giving uh, such a young patient a, pace, a pacemaker. But if the pathway is in a good location that implies low risk, we typically proceed with ablation. In summary, WW, WPW pattern in the absence of symptoms uh, could be clinically challenging. Uh, and we know that in patients uh, who have this pattern in the absence of uh, symptoms uh, could be at low risk of sudden period death, but they need to be aware of the development of symptoms being uh, indicators of subsequent risk. The main uh, factor determining uh, the risk of sudden cardiac death is the integrate conduction properties of the accessory pathway such as a short pre-excited, a short, the shortest pre-excited RR interval being less than or more than 250 millisecond, having a good negative predictive value, knowing that intermittent pre-excitation or loss of pre-excitation means less risk, but otherwise we typically proceed with AP testing and possible uh, With that, and thank you, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer uh, any questions uh, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emin, for a uh, wonderful and very informative talk. Um, I think uh, for the sake of time, we'll leave questions uh, for the end. I wanted to remind all our uh, participants to uh, use the Q&A uh, chat uh, for any questions that you have. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kaldun Tarakji. Uh, he is uh, an electrophysiologist at
uh, uh, the uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Uh, he is a world expert and world leader on uh, remote uh, monitoring technologies. Uh, he's widely published. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to have him join us. He's going to be uh, talking to us about uh, digital uh, technology. The title of his talk is My Digital Watch, Detect and Rhythmia, and uh, Now What? Good morning. I'm, Zaziba. I'm an electrophysiologist uh, at the Cleveland Clinic in uh, Cleveland. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to be part of this webinar series. Uh, I will be talking about uh, the management strategies of uh, atrial fibrillation in cardiomyopathy. These are my disclosures. The learning objectives for this next 10 minutes is to recognize the relationship between atrial fibrillation and heart failure and discuss the treatment modalities of atrial fibrillation in this setting, and also to recognize the impact of non-pharmacologic therapy for atrial fibrillation in heart failure patient, and most importantly, outline the survival benefit of atrial fibrillation ablation uh, therapy. Atrial fibrillation and heart failure coexists. Uh, they are frequently encountered together. 34% uh, of patients with atrial fibrillation have an associated diagnosis of heart failure, and almost 42% of patients with heart failure also have concomitant atrial fibrillation. Almost to say that atrial fibrillation begets heart failure and heart failure begets atrial fibrillation. And really, atrial fibrillation may lead to heart failure by virtue of its uh, rapid ventricular rate, loss of regularity of the RR interval, as well as the toxicities of antiarrhythmic medications. And in terms, heart failure can lead to atrial fibrillation because of several mechanisms, including interstitial fibrosis, volume, and pressure overload, uh, which leads to uh, programmed cell death, uh, and that can affect uh, heterogeneity of conduction and uh, refractory period that can change the structure as well as the electrical properties of the atrium and promotes atrial fibrillation. fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we know that the presence of atrial fibrillation is associated with an increased mortality in that patient population. What we do not know or what we did not know is whether treatment of atrial fibrillation in the setting of heart failure would reverse that trend of increased mortality and improve survival. And I will talk about certain recent data that seem to suggest that this is when we talk about treatment of atrial fibrillation, we are talking about reducing the risk of stroke. We are talking about controlling the ventricular rate to prevent cardiomyopathy related to rapid ventricular rate. We are talking about trying to restore normal rhythm and some risk factor modification. Um, it is very important to reduce the risk of stroke because heart failure increases the risk of stroke in patients with AFib by almost a factor of two. Um, Rate control can be achieved pharmacologically or with AV node ablation with placement of a permanent pacemaker. As you know, rhythm control is actually achieved with either antiarrhythmic medication or catheter ablation. And the question is, how does rate control stack against rhythm control? Is it better to only control the rate or the rhythm? In terms of controlling the rate, is pharmacologic agents such as beta blocker or calcium channel blockers better than AV node ablation and pacing? When it comes to rhythm control, are antiarrhythmic medications better than catheter ablation? And more importantly, if catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, is it better than an AV node ablation with placement of a biventricular pacemaker? If we take this case of a 66-year-old female patient with history of hypertension who presents with dyspnea on exertion, um, her EKG shows that she has atrial fibrillation with an average ventricular rate of 115 beats per minute, but it goes up to 180 beats per minute when she is active and exercising, and she has evidence of left ventricular dysfunction with an EF of 20 to 25 percent, along with mild to moderate mitral regurgitation by echocardiography. But is it better to just control her rate and leave her alone, or do we actually seek the possibility of restoring normal rhythm. And let's put this issue to uh, rest. The rhythm versus rate control issue, and I know that Dr. Wozniak talked about it, but um, 
in the past, there have been several studies that looked at that and showed that there was no survival benefits of one strategy versus the other. But that's because all of these strategies used antiarrhythmic medication for rhythm control. And whatever benefits you gain by getting back into normal sinus rhythm, you might lose by the negative side effect of the antiarrhythmic medication. And this is why that comparison turns out to be neutral. Now, if you look at the guidelines and see what kind of medications you can use for rhythm control in heart failure patients, you can see that the choice is really restricted to only two medications, amiodarone and tofetal. And the reason behind it is that these are the only two medications that were proven in clinical trials not to in increase mortality in patients with left ventricular dysfunction. And it's for that reason that those medications are safe. Now, that is not to say that they are very effective. They are effective up to a certain point, but the question is, how do they compare to other strategies to control the rhythm in those patients with left ventricular dysfunction? All what we know is that they are safe to a certain extent. You know, amiodarone has lots of side effects. It can affect the lungs, the liver, the eyes, the thyroid, and the skin, as well as dofetilide has some side effects, include sudden death, by virtue of its uh, QT prolongation effect. Now, in patients in whom maintenance of normal sinus rhythm is not possible with either medications or with ablation, then we have to resort to a rate control strategy uh, because at some point atrial fibrillation might win. And the ultimate rate control strategy is an AV node ablation with placement of a permanent pacemaker or a defibrillator if the LVEF is less than 35%. And in those patients, it has been clearly shown that biventricular pacing is better than right ventricular pacing alone. And now we have the option of having his bundle pacing as well as left bundle pacing that actually um, offer uh, an additional strategy in those patients uh, following AV node ablation. And in those patients, there is data from Europe uh, that is relatively old but still holds true to suggest that in patients who already have a biventricular pacemaker or ICD device, it is probably better to do an AV node ablation rather than just uh, try to force rate control with pharmacologic therapy because you want to maximize the amount of biventricular pacing that those patients have. Um, and we have data actually to suggest that ensuring 100% biventricular pacing in patients with atrial fibrillation, left ventricular dysfunction, and biventricular device, 100% biventricular pacing is associated actually with an improved survival as compared to even 90% or 70% biventricular pacing. And therefore, an AV node ablation in those patients is recommended. But before we get to the point of needing an AV node ablation and permanent pacemaker, what is the role of atrial fibrillation ablation in patients with atrial fibrillation and left ventricular dysfunction? Now, we know from a meta-analysis that is now dating back from 2010 that at catheter ablation studies, including patients with reduced left ventricular function, Ablation is associated with an absolute improvement in LVEF of around 11%. And there's a significant variability in those patients. But nevertheless, it at least suggests that doing a natural fibrillation ablation in those patients might lead to some improvement in their left ventricular ejection fraction. If you look at studies that are as old as 2004, you can see that when atrial fibrillation ablation was offered to patients with left ventricular dysfunction, there was a significant improvement in left ventricular function with an absolute improvement of almost 21% within the first six months following a successful ablation. And what is important to note is that this improvement was irrespective of whether the patient had adequate ventricular rate control prior to the ablation or not. So it is not just dependent on whether the patient was tachycardic or had rapid ventricular control, as much as it is dependent on actually restoring normal rhythm and regularizing the rate. And if you look at the comparison between atrial fibrillation ablation versus AV node ablation plus biventricular pacing, you can see that from this PABA CHF that patients who are actually randomized to atrial fibrillation ablation had a much better improvement in their left ventricular function as well as a functional improvement 
in their six-minute walk and functional capacity. Finally, if you compare atrial fibrillation ablation to antiarrhythmic drug in this situation, amiodarone in the ATT&CK trial, which compared atrial fibrillation ablation to amiodarone in patients with left ventricular dysfunction, you can see that patients who underwent atrial fibrillation ablation uh, had actually better freedom from atrial fibrillation, had reduced unplanned hospitalization, and the trend towards improved survival. If you look at the Castle AFib study uh, that looked at the effectiveness of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation patients with LV dysfunction, the randomizing them to AFib ablation versus conventional therapy, you can see that not only was there an improvement in LVEF and functional capacity, but this is the first study that actually was able to show an improved survival in patients with left ventricular function who were randomized to atrial fibrillation. There was also an improvement in heart failure progression compared to conventional standard therapy as depicted by a reduction in hospitalization for worsening heart failure. Again, this is the first study that showed a 37% reduction in mortality in patients who underwent atrial fibrillation ablation compared to standard medical therapy. Even in the Cabana trial, which was the largest randomized AFib ablation trial, looking at the endpoint that includes mortality, as you know, the overall result of that trial was neutral with the intention to treat analysis. But when you look at the subgroup of patients who might benefit from ablation, you can see that the patients who have history of congestive heart failure were more likely to derive a survival benefit from an ablation versus conventional therapy with an odd ratio of 1.47. Finally, what is the role of risk factor modifications? And we should not uh, forget the role of uh, risk factor modification, which includes treatment of hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, which most patients with heart failure tend to have as comorbidities anyway. More importantly, exercise, improved cardiovascular fitness, are also on top of that list. I know it is difficult to get patients with heart failure to move because they tend to have exertional symptoms, but with re-education, a um, little bit more motivation, this lifestyle modification can go a long way in reducing atrial fibrillation burden. In our patients that we presented earlier, we performed an AFib ablation, and on the way out, we did an AV node ablation. Um, and uh, sure enough, on follow-up, uh, four to six months later, her ejection fraction has improved from 25 to 50 percent. Uh, she did not have any more heart failure admission in one year, and her functional class improved uh, from three to four down to uh, two. So in conclusion, I think atrial fibrillation and heart failure are common conditions and frequently coexist. The use of antiarrhythmic drug is restricted to class three, amiodarone and dofetilide, because of their neutral effect on mortality. Rhythm control, when possible, is superior to rate control. For rate control patients with CRT, AV node ablation is superior to medical therapy. When compared to conventional standard therapy, AFib ablation is associated with an improved all-cause mortality, fewer admissions for worsening heart failure, and is superior to AV junction ablation plus CRT. Stroke prophylaxis is an important parallel arm in the management of AFib with heart failure patients, and these patients need to be on oral anticoagulation. And finally, risk factor modification leads to further improvement in maintenance of normal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saliba, for a, a fantastic talk. And, and uh, uh, apologies uh, and uh, corrections. Dr. Saliba needed no introduction. Uh, uh, I had. Uh, uh, we had uh, accidentally introduced Dr. Khaldun uh, on the previous talk, so uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, delighted to have him uh, talk now uh, about um, atrial fibrillation uh, uh, detected on uh, a digital watch. Uh, Hi, today we're going to be talking about the new chief complaint that we've been encountering in our clinics as cardiologists, which is my digital watch detected an arrhythmia, what should I do? These are my disclosures. 
Today we're going to be talking about the landscape of cardiac monitors, including wearables, the needs for atrial fibrillation as far as prevalence and projection, and also to talk about the role of wearables in providing better care for our patients. Now, I think the question in the title is a reflection of the transform in the new era of digital health. It used to have the central role of working in the science with industry or pharmaceutical company coming up with a product for the it goes through multiple vigorous clinical trials before we present it to the patients on uh, based on their new companies coming up with innovative products that they get sold to the consumers directly and we are on the receiving end trying to find the needs. So what are the needs for atrial fibrillation? It's the most common arrhythmia that affects millions of patients and will continue to increase it accounts for 20% of strokes, and unfortunately, a stroke continues to be sometimes the first manifestation of atrial fibrillation among our patients. In order to assess the risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation, we use the chads vast score based on some variables. We calculate the score, and based on the score, we assess the adjusted stroke risk per year. And by guidelines, if your chads vast score is two or above, that patient needs to be on anticoagulation. It's important to note that uh, the guidelines do not take into account the pattern of the atrial fibrillation, whether it's paroxysmal or persistent, or the AFib burden itself. Now, when it comes to technology to, to detect atrial fibrillation, we have plenty of monitors, both traditional ones like a holter or event monitor or continuous telemetry, some of them in new format of patches, but also we have a new wave of wearable devices, including smart watches and bands. And to me, it's really not really a competition between these devices, but it's really based on the needs of the patients. And my guide when I see any patient in clinic is, are they symptomatic or not? And if they are symptomatic, what's the frequency of their symptoms, frequency of these episodes? Am I dealing with post-stroke? Are we trying to identify if there's any AFib, including silent AFib? Or are we talking about random screening for high-risk individuals or anyone? And once you have this clarity, then you, it's easy to decide which monitor you need. So, for example, for symptomatic and frequent episodes, daily symptoms, all what you need is one of the traditional monitors, and whether it's a holter or event monitor, and they will give you the answer and the diagnosis that you need. But we all have that symptomatic patients that they get infrequent episodes. They happen once every few months. And it's really frustrating because they run to the emergency room and they try to catch an episode and the episode is gone before they hit the door. For these type of patients, I think these wearables and smart watches and bands can provide great asset for us. This is an example of a 58 year old man with palpitation who was dismissed as having anxiety attack. And he started using the Cardia device, as you can see, and it records a rhythm strip and to orient you the green dots, they represent the recordings of sinus rhythm and the yellow or orange ones, it's an atrial fibrillation episode after he started using the device for a few months. So these are great devices to establish a diagnosis. A similar example, but different uh, technology. This is the Apple Watch of a 62 year old man who was overseas with no access to any medical facility. On the left, you see sinus rhythm and very nice recording of atrial fibrillation on the right side. So great tools to establish a diagnosis. AFib is a chronic uh, disease and it requires multiple intervention and therefore the follow-up is important. So somebody who had AFib and had cardioversion or ablation, you need these tools to provide you with the follow-up. And again, I think wearables provide great tools to establish this. This is a 44-year-old man who had AFib and after cardioversion, we stopped his DOAC because his chance bad score was zero and he started recording and one day he went into AFib, immediately started taking his DOAC called us four days later and we proceeded with a cardioversion without the need for transesophageal echo. Again, a great tool to manage patients with AFib. As a word of uh, caution, I tell all my patients who are using these devices, we tell them that we did a lot of studies to assess these devices, assess their algorithms, whether it's uh, devices, separate devices or bands. And in general, the messages are very similar. These devices work and they will do the job for you and they record a rhythm strip. Patients will adopt them if they get educated about how to use it. 
the automated algorithms, they're good, but they're not perfect. And still for any clinical decision to be made, you still need the physician overread. For that reason, uh, the, you have many examples that remind us about why the physician overread is important. On the left side, you clearly see a recording of sinus rhythm with PVCs misinterpreted uh, by the device itself as possible AFib. And on the right side, another device, Apple Watch, clearly atrial fibrillation labeled as sinus rhythm. And for that reason, you need the physician overread. And in order to make this feasible, you need the workflow and the, the platform to enable you to do this, review them and embed them into your electronic medical record. And that's what we do at the clinic. So we have a platform where we can access the recordings of the patient remotely through the cloud and we can see them on the right side of the screen and conduct a virtual visit. And we've been doing virtual visits at the clinic since 2016 before the pandemic. And as you can see, we conducted a survey to assess their feedback, which by large was very positive in our uh, arrhythmia clinic, especially in monitoring AFib patients. Well, the one column that I wanna highlight in addition that they were able to see the physician, ask all the questions, but it's the third column that they were able to share their rhythm data with their caring physician. Again, that's why this platform will enable you to take your virtual visit to a completely different level supported by data. I had a stroke with unclear source. Well, the law of the land is to implant a loop recorder. It will do the job and it will give you the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation if it's present better than ambulatory remote monitoring. Can wearables replace loop? Well, by combining the features of smart watches and smart bands that are continuously monitoring the pulse, if they detect any irregularities, they alert the patient and notify the patient to record a rhythm strip. And that's how they turn into kind of semi-continuous monitoring, not of the rhythm, but for the pulse with on-demand ECG to support it. And it's amazing that patients, again, as I mentioned, they come to you with these ideas. This is a lady that I saw recently in clinic referred by her neurologist after a cryptogenic stroke or stroke of undetermined source, now we call it. And by the time she came to see me, her son got her an Apple Watch as a, as a Christmas gift and she started recording. And then all along and behold, she got the notification about irregular pulse. She got the alert, she recorded. And as you can see, beautiful uh, recording of atrial fibrillation. She did not need the loop and I started her on a DOAC. What about the patient who's never had AFib, but they have multiple risk factors and they're just concerned? Well, we have plenty of studies, including from our device uh, patients, pacemakers or defibrillators to tell us that the longer you follow these patients up, the more AFib you are gonna detect. And actually this AFib does correlate with the risk of stroke. What we don't know whether intervening by this, I mean starting anticoagulation, whether you're gonna be decreasing the risk of stroke or not, that's still not yet known, but more studies are ongoing to shed some light. What about the general public? Well, that was the essence of the Apple Heart study, which was truly an open invitation of anybody who's using the Apple Watch. This is the generation that did not have the ability to record rhythm strip. So they had to confirm it by a subsequent patch. And after enrolling close to half million individuals, 0.5% got the notification about possible irregular heartbeat. And for those who were sent the patch afterwards, 34% who had AFib. And for those who had simultaneous patch and the watch, the positive predictive value was 84%. But we also, this study raises a lot of concerns about the young patients with no risk factors and they get AFib detection. What do you do with the information and are you gonna be just simply increasing the anxiety? It's important to note that there are differences between the US and the European guidelines when it comes to random screening of individuals. While the US guidelines, they still do not recommend doing this random screening, the European guidelines actually do support opportunistic screening of AFib, whether it's by pulse or ECG rhythm strip for patients who are 65 years of age or older. The field is moving from just simply AFib detection to outcome studies. And this is a hardline study, which basically is gonna look at all Medicare beneficiaries who want to enroll and they will be provided with the Apple Watch. And the goal is not just to see the rate of AFib detection, but also through claims data to see the incidence of stroke, starting anticoagulation, bleeding. So we're gonna move from just simple detection to outcome data as well.
So the key takeaways, smart device ECG could be an asset in your practice for the care of the arrhythmia patient. It's really not about the device, but it's more about the patient and the indication. There are some challenges, but great opportunities for us to provide better care. Thank you very much, and I hope we meet in person next year. Thank you, Dr. Khaldun Tarakshi, for a wonderful talk uh, and a, a beautiful summary of some uh, very interesting uh, uh, technology. Um, I guess I'll start with, I have a, we don't have any questions right now from the audience, but I'll start with a question to uh, Dr. Khaldun. Uh, I think uh, wearable devices are, or, or remote monitoring has been really a, a huge um, uh, a benefit uh, in monitoring device patients uh, in the time of coronavirus uh, and social distancing. Uh, how have you utilized uh, wearable devices uh, in, in this time, or have it, ha has your utilization of these devices with patients increased? Yeah, thank you, Mohammed, and thanks everyone. Uh, pleasure to be with everybody. Um, yeah, no question about it. I think the advantage that we had in electrophysiology that we've been doing remote monitoring for many years, in fact, decades, when it comes to monitoring devices, implantable devices, uh, for example. So we had the tools, but there's no question about it. There's been an exponential growth uh, with the pandemic. And that does not uh, include only wearables, but including the use of telemedicine and conducting virtual visits. Um, my slides have not changed before or after the pandemic, but it's the magnitude of the use. Uh, to give you an example, um, at the clinic, we've been doing virtual visits, not only in cardiovascular medicine, but what we noted that about 20% of uh, staff physicians were conducting over 80% of all virtual visits. What does that mean? It means that you had the few who were interested conducting the majority, but it was not really a common practice or an expectation from everybody. I can assure you with the pandemic, 100% um, of our staff physicians are conducting virtual visits. And also it's become an expectation from our patients. Uh, remember that uh, with these devices, when it comes to wearables, to answer your question, um, they're not waiting for us to order this. They're coming to us using these devices. And we know that they work. We've done the research to, to show the good and the, the areas of uncertainty. So we just need to embrace it and get along basically because they will do the job for you and they will really take the, your care to a different level. And one last thing I would mention that although everybody's saying that you know virtual visits is important, but you really need to support it with data. Otherwise it will be a glorified phone conversation, but one virtual visit with data from a wearable over the last few months, it's probably more meaningful than one in-person visit with one single ECG. Thank you. Uh, we've certainly, I, I've certainly uh, seen the benefit of wearables uh, in this time, and uh, you know we've had patients who have presented up to us for the first time with with an arrhythmia uh, that they've had treated just uh, from a wearable. It's something that's that's really changed our practice in the last few years. Um, the next question I'll I'll have for Doctor uh, Walid. Um, the uh, there, there's no question that there's a benefit, a mortality benefit in, in ablation and heart failure. Uh, is there a cutoff where you wouldn't ablate a patient, let's say uh, a certain uh, left atrial size or duration of atrial fibrillation? When someone comes to you with uh, heart failure and they have persistent atrial fibrillation, you know, is there a time where you say, well, this is they're unlikely to be to have a successful uh, a maintenance of sinus rhythm approach, or how would you approach such a patient? Um, th this is a very uh, important question and uh, a very good question because even though we say that we advocate an aggressive approach for patients with heart failure in terms of managing their atrial fibrillation and uh, putting back putting them back in normal rhythm, obviously uh, there are for every problem there are two ends of the spectrum. Uh, there are patients who have uh, severely depressed left ventricular ejection fraction. And uh, you can uh, understand that those patients probably have already a burnt out cardiomyopathy. Uh, EF down in the 15% and the atria is, are huge. And you can have a gut feeling that those patients will probably not uh, have a good outcome in terms of long-term maintenance of normal rhythm, no matter what you do. Uh, 
It is not much the cutoff in the ejection fraction because we have seen patients with very bad EF, um, secondary to uh, cardiomyopathy related to tachycardia in whom you give them the chance to go back in normal rhythm and they improve dramatically. So it is essentially the presence of comorbidities. What is the reason of their depressed ejection fraction? Is it because of uh, some uh, parameters such as their body habitus, uh, uh, burnt out hypertension, uh, several myocardial infarct in whom it is less likely that those patients are gonna even improve their ejection fraction or improve or have a long-term maintenance of normal rhythm or is it because uh, some factors that are partially reversible? I truly believe that everybody who is presenting with the first time atrial fibrillation, uh, it deserves a chance at being placed back into normal rhythm, be it pharmacologically or with an ablation to see how they're gonna behave in normal rhythm. Are they gonna have an improvement in ejection fraction? Are they gonna have an improvement in symptoms, a change in symptoms? And then you can, based on the recurrent pattern of their arrhythmia, decide how aggressive you wanna be thereafter. If we put somebody in atrial fibrillation, we put them back in normal rhythm, whether you put them on amiodarone or doferalide, and they don't have much change in their EF, they don't have much improvement in symptoms, that patient is probably have a burnt out problem and it's less likely that he's gonna derive any benefit. Uh, whereas somebody who has an improvement in ejection fraction and a significant improvement in symptoms, this is a patient that will be very aggressive about uh, pushing forward with an ablation. Thank you, Dr. Waleed. That was a, that, that's a great uh, response. Uh, would be a similar kind of practice that I would, uh, that I would do. Um, I just want to remind the audience, if they have any questions, to pose them to us in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Khaled, uh, if you're with us, uh, I'll, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about um, uh, patients with high risk of bleeding uh, who aren't candidates for anticoagulation. What do you do in those patients uh, if you're, you know, if you're going to consider them for left atrial appendage occlusion? Are they, you know, is there any uh, place for patients who can't take anticoagulation at all or contraindicated to anticoagulation? What's your strategy? Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you to our guests from Cleveland. We greatly appreciate your uh, being with us tonight. So um, if there is an absolute contraindication uh, where you cannot even put them on short-term um, antiplatelet or anticoagulation, then you don't really want to make things worse by putting a device in the heart, and then you end up you know, worrying about thrombosis of the device and the risk of bleeding and making you know, a somewhat bad situation even worse because these are not things that you can easily retrieve or just remove if you don't want them. So there is an initial period where the device needs to basically settle in and get endothelialized. And that period can be a prothrombotic period and you really need, uh, you know, depending, the watchman has a very firm um, uh, algorithm for, you know, how you address that anticoagulation initially. Uh, the, the amulet device, which is uh, more used in Europe, has a more uh, uh, open uh, kind of a play field. So there is more room to maneuver with medications. But there are some circumstances where sometimes you get away. Again, it's a shared decision, a shared decision making with the patient. You can get away sometimes with a single antiplatelet agent. It's not recommended. You don't want to, again, make a bad situation worse. So you really have to evaluate every case. You don't want to give up on anybody. All these patients should be evaluated. It should be a multidisciplinary approach, you know, with the GI doctors and the neurology doctors. Uh, the timing sometimes when we get a referral from a neurologist saying the patient just had a subdural hematoma or an intracranial bleed. Well, initially, you know, when, when you can't uh, give them heparin during the anticoagulation for the procedure itself, uh, you know, that's not the time to be doing these things. So the patient or the patient's family has to be a major player in this discussion and then the other teams just like we talked about the AFib clinic this is again part of you know management of atrial fibrillation multidisciplinary approach having a lot of uh, people from different uh, disciplines of medicine uh, discuss these cases and come to a suitable decision or a set of options for the patient 
Khalid, I, I, let me just uh, collaborate on this point. I fully agree with your answer. Um, it is a shared decision making, and uh, th th there are some patients whose risk of stroke is very, very high, and so their risk of bleeding. And sometimes we've been aggressive. Uh, even patients who had GI bleeding, who bleed when we give them anticoagulation, we've transfused them on a weekly basis just to satisfy uh, that uh, period of time uh, where we need to give them anticoagulation around the uh, procedure time, just to get that device in them. And actually, I'm going to put Dr. Hussein on the spot. Uh, and I'm sorry, Ayman, I'm going to put you on the well, spot. Actually, because, I was gonna, I was yeah, gonna... because you're, you, uh, the, Dr. Hussein is, is the lead author on a couple of our uh, experience at the Cleveland Clinic with the high-risk bleeders. Go ahead, Ayman. Just, uh, yeah, so I agree with uh, Dr. Almaty and both Dr. Saliba here that it is, uh, it is a tailored approach uh, on a case-by-case -case basis um, in a multidisciplinary assessment, uh, you know, uh, format. Um, technically speaking, we were very selective at the clinic, and we've been very selective in terms of uh, who we give a watchman device to and who we don't. And uh, at least the first uh, two or three hundred patients, you know, that we that we uh, that we implanted, were all patients who had previous uh, major bleeding events. So, in other words, there are there were no patients that were truly at, 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 at risk of recurrence uh, of major bleed for uh, the purpose of implanting a watchman, especially in the era of, of NOx, especially with uh, things like Eloquiz. So uh, in a multidisciplinary approach and working with our colleagues in, uh, you know, in neurology, um, you know, neurosurgery, uh, GI doctors, uh, you know, for the most part, we've been, we've been able to uh, implant almost everybody uh, even those with major bleeding events. Uh, but obviously, it's not one size fits all, and uh, it's still going to be a multidisciplinary assessment on a case by case basis. And actually, uh, you know, with no axe, we've, we've been doing great. So, uh, especially Aliquis. So, uh, that has been our approach. And we had actually, we published on both uh, patients with high risk of bleeding and implanting in patients with high risk of stroke. And we showed both uh, efficacy and safety in these populations. Keeping in mind that these are retrospective analyses, and there are patients, and I agree, there are patients uh, such as patients with uh, cerebral uh, angioid uh, uh, amyloid angiopathy. They, they they are they really scare you when you want to give them anticoagulation, and you have to assess the risk of bleeding very carefully with the neurologist and uh, discuss that with the patient. Evaluate that against the risk of stroke before you offer such therapy to to these patients. So yes, I agree. There is a group of patients in whom, with the current post or periprocedural anticoagulation regimens that we have, are at risk of bleeding, and you probably would not get close to them, even with a 10-foot ball. Yeah, so the, 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 the multidisciplinary approach here cannot, uh, or the importance of it cannot be, uh, you know, overemphasized. It, that, that is key in terms of approaching those patients and deciding what's best for them. And I'll tell you that in our region, we never get the easy cases. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. had a you know, case this morning, somebody who just recently had a large embolus, uh, you know, of AFib origin to her right groin. So you know, they just did the embolectomy and there is a big wound, BMI of 40. Uh, so, you, you know, you, but she's very high risk. They have her on low molecular weight heparin. She bled multiple times, multiple transfusions. So, you know, trying to do transeptal from the left groin and, you know, huge BMI and all of these technical issues. It, we have not had easy cases, but despite that, and despite the fact that these are older patients for the most part, the outcomes have been good. So. Really, it's, it's about just spreading the word and al allowing the, the, the physicians in the community to know that there are options. The, the worst option is to just do nothing and just let patients, you know, have strokes and bleeds and, and not, not try to see if there is a solution for those patients. Well, they agree. Yeah. There, there's a question that I'm going to actually uh, uh, give it to Dr. Toragji because he mentioned it in one of his slides. One of the questions from the audience is, what is the minimum duration of atrial fibrillation with knee, which uh, warrants anticoagulation if the CHADS VASC is high? Yeah, no, this is a great question. And I think I, in the same slide, I mentioned that uh, one of the downside of the CHADS VASC score that we use is the fact that it doesn't take into account the nature of atrial fibrillation, whether it's paroxysmal or persistent, and also the burden of uh, atrial fibrillation. And that, that is the million dollar question, how much is too much of AFib to warrant anticoagulation? 
I think in general, I mean, with the rule that we go by is anything more than 24 hours is, is enough for us to start feeling nervous. And beyond this, nobody would cut your vert, for example, without being on anticoagulation. But what we learned from many studies and uh, that uh, even, even AFib that is about six minutes can correlate with more incidence of thromboembolic phenomena. Now, careful, I, you know, that's different than saying that starting anticoagulation will reverse that risk or will decrease that risk because it comes also at the expense of bleeding risk. And there's actually a nice uh, paper, I believe it's in circulation when uh, it's a table when you have on one side, the higher the Chad's vas score, the higher your risk of stroke, irrespective of the duration, like even with minimum AFib. And also the, uh, the opposite is also true. When, when uh, the AFib is persistent, uh, the risk of stroke increases even with a lower Chad's vas score. I think the for now we go by the 24 hour rule. Although I think if you have a high Chad's vast score, uh, this is a bit of a schizophrenic state that we live because if you had somebody who coming to you with a stroke and they have an implantable loop, for example, or an ambulatory remote monitoring, even few minutes of atrial fibrillation will warrant anticoagulation. Help is on the way because there are a couple large trials, the Artesia trial and the NOAA trial. They're trying to exactly address this question if you have AFib that's detected by implantable device that is six minutes or more, even a minimum amount of AFib, um, but with, uh, with Chad's vas corda three and higher, uh, these patients are getting randomized between uh, DOAC versus uh, antiplatelet only. So stay tuned. I think we'll help us on the way with addressing this question. Okay. Um... I think that uh, we're getting very close to uh, the end of uh, this uh, session. Um, uh, let me first uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Al-Jabri for uh, co-moderating uh, this uh, webinar uh, with me. I wanna definitely thank the panel uh, and the faculty uh, who did a superb job uh, in addressing some of the uh, very challenging questions in atrial fibrillation and electrophysiology today. Uh, I would like also to thank the participants uh, for taking the time to listen to us and uh, uh, enjoyed the, the questions. And with this, I will probably give it to Dr. Al-Jabiri uh, for uh, you wanna uh, probably uh, have an announcement as to next uh, webinar. Thank you, Dr. Walid, uh, and, and thanks to all our uh, faculty from uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation. It's really a delight to have you join us uh, and an honor. And thank you to our audience. Uh... You're muted, uh, Dr. Jabari. Yeah, thank you, Walid, uh, and thank you to all our uh, uh, faculty from the uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation. It's really an honor to have you join us, and thanks to our audience for uh, your participation and for uh, listening to us. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that we still have three more uh, episodes of our webinars coming up. Uh, valvular heart disease is next up on the 28th of March, uh, 2021. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to you joining us uh, then. Yes. Yeah, and thank you for MCI. They did a superb job connecting us all together from different parts of the world. Thanks very much. It's a difficult job in these times. Yes. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. Okay. You guys have a good day. Bye. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you so much.